Hey everyone. Welcome to the Uniting America podcast presented to you by Braver Angels. I'm Braver Angels National Ambassador and your host, John Wood Jr. This is your doorway into the movement to save the Republic, the movement to realize the dream of Martin Luther King. Join us. This is the movement to build a house united. Joshua Mitchell is a professor of political theory at Georgetown University, former acting chancellor of the American University of Iraq, one of America's leading classical liberal scholars and a foremost expert in the teachings of Alexis de Tocqueville. We talk a lot about de Tocqueville in this conversation, and well, if you don't know anything about the 19th century Frenchman who authored Democracy in America, you should. And it just so happens that at Braver Angels, we once showcased a conversation with descendants of de Tocqueville streamed all the way from the Tocqueville estate in Normandy, France. Professor Mitchell is often associated with the national conservatism movement, along with figures such as Euro Mazzoni, who argues for the importance of tradition in our culture and the role of the state in preserving it. But Professor Mitchell is something of a philosophical conscience in these circles, drawing attention to the need of modern conservatism to return to the practice of community to reckon with the need for justice that left-wing activism speaks to, and to avoid dangerous ideologies of blood and soil which seek to, quote, re-enchant the world. A slight correction to one thing Josh says, I was not, in fact, in attendance at the National Conservatism Convention in 2017. Uh, He and I met a year later on a panel for the American Project at Pepperdine. And I remember then, as you will see now, that Professor Mitchell was a soulful thinker, a conservative who has no issue being fair to his opponents on the left and critical of his friends on the right if that's where reason leads him. If you're paying attention, he is someone from whom it is easy to learn. And now, Joshua Mitchell. Josh, how are you doing, my friend? I'm well, John. How are you? I'm well, and it's great to welcome you to Uniting America. First of all, um, let me just say that uh, you are someone who I have got to know, I think, pretty well over the last uh, last couple of years. Five years. Yeah. Oh goodness, has it been has it been that yeah. long? But yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. Wow, time time goes by quickly. You you and I are associated with each other, at least initially, uh, through the uh through what's called the American Project, uh, out of the Pepperdine School of uh, Public Policy. Of course, we've we've recently, I guess, changed the changed the name of the of yeah. the center. Um and uh goodness, I feel bad. I'm blanking on it. Can you can you remember the the, the Edme Center? That's right. We are now named after after uh, Ed Meese, former attorney general under Ronald Reagan uh, back in the day. And um, uh, we share uh, an interest in sort of revitalizing the communitarian uh, sort of uh, core of the conservative philosophy. That's something I think we might have a little opportunity to talk about here. Uh, You and I, of course, are also connected through the work of the Woodson Center uh, and, uh, the network of, uh, activists and intellectuals that, uh, work with and around, uh, Bob Woodson, um, of course the 1776 Unites Project came out of that, that group. And we both have a deep, uh, a deep interest in, uh, building bridges, uh, across racial divides, engaging issues of poverty, uh, et cetera. And in that, uh, in that space of time, uh, I've gotten to know you as somebody who has a deep commitment to a vision of American democracy, which I think preserves sort of the soul uh, in the relational sort of fabric that's meant animate uh, the the way by which we engage the project of self-governance is one that requires us to know one another and yeah. be connected to each other in a deeper way. Um, what I'd like you to do um, is to just say a little bit about how you come into the space of ideas, what your sort of journey has been that has led you to sort of be a, a man of a man of letters, a man of thought, and then to say a little bit uh, after that about just sort of what your broader worldview is. So take us into the Joshua Mitchell story. Okay. Uh, I should probably start by saying uh, I was born in the Middle East. My father was doing research on a little-known group called the Muslim Brotherhood, and spent his life talking about it long before anybody was around. So I I came out of the world of ideas, uh, but I deliberately rejected it. I was a carpenter for a time, musician on the road for a time, things you don't, I don't think you know about, Uh, (laughs) but came back in my late 20s and uh, became really fascinated with Alexis de Tocqueville and his book, Democracy in America, which was written in 1835. And I remember in 1989, when I 
finished my PhD and did not uh, did not have a job. Uh, I went to the library and read uh, Alexis Tocqueville's Democracy in America, actually the first 11 pages of the introduction, spent three and a half hours with it and said to myself, you'll spend the rest of your life with this book. So mm. uh, I am uh, I am firmly convinced um, <clears throat> that he is the only one going into the 21st century who has a comprehensive account of the great problem of the modern age. And, and points in the direction of solving it. And so his account, in a couple of words, is that the great crisis of the modern world is going to be loneliness and delinkage. And what he worried about was that, in, in the American case, that there would be all these forces which would conspire to pull us apart further and further. And he said, look, if you you're, you're going to get to equality, but there's two kinds of equality. There's equality in servitude and equality in liberty. And if you want to have equality in liberty, you're going to have to have these face-to-face associations and build the world together. And that's incredibly difficult to do. Or you can give up and look to the one visible power that's left, namely the state, and you'll have equality, but it'll be equality in servitude at the end of history. And th- that, that distinction has been guiding me for 30 years in all that I do. Mm. Indeed. You have uh, this deep relationship to the thought of, of uh, Alexis de Tocqueville. And it's interesting because on the one hand, for those who know his, um, for those who know democracy in America uh, and Tocqueville's observations, there's a sense that de Tocqueville, who of course uh, uh, was a visitor to the United States uh, of America, right? Um, uh, brought with him, or at least uh, uh put uh, down in that book sort of a deep catalog of observations about the American character, which is very much definitive to our own understanding of ourselves, for those who, who are familiar with that work. And yet, Remembrance of de Tocqueville, I don't think, travels very far beyond um, relatively narrower circles of folks who have actually sort of engaged him. Has modern American conservatism forgotten de Tocqueville, in, in your opinion? And if so, what are the consequences of that? So this is a this is a great question, John, and I think there needs to be a lot of soul searching on the right uh, about this. So it, it is the case that conservatives have talked about Tocqueville, and some are, are really serious scholars of Tocqueville. But I think what's happened largely uh, is that this insight has has been forgotten. So in the Reagan years, for example, market efficiency was set forth as the highest good, and I think. There's a reckoning here on the right, and it is occurring. And you and I also, I should point out, were at that first meeting of the NatCon group uh, back in New York and just after Trump was elected. And what was remarkable about that gathering was that, that we all said out loud what we'd been thinking, which is that free markets alone yeah. can't be the basis of building a society. And so, uh, so what Tocqueville sees, I think, is that, uh, that we have to, we have to build a society by having these face to face relations. And the, the conservative movement has gotten this from time to time and then lost sight of it. So it was there in the Reagan years a bit, but then the free market rationality just completely trumped it. Um, in the early 1990s, since you've mentioned the word communitarianism, there was a huge movement in the academic circles. And even among practitioners and NGO folks, um, to recover this idea about civic associations. Recall after 1989, what happened was that in Eastern Europe, people were looking for answers. How can we fortify democracy? Mm-hmm. And there was this resurgence of interest in Tocqueville and civic associations. Uh, and so that, that happened. There was a lot of talk about that, but I don't think conservatives quite know what to do about this. Remember, these were the Clinton years. So the conservatives really didn't have a chance to do this in the 1990s. And then there was some hope at the beginning of the Bush administration that this idea would be recovered, this Tocquevillian idea. But then 9-11 happened, and we've built effectively a national security state since then. Mm. Uh, we've lost sight in the level of policymakers of this Tocquevillian insight that we really have to build a world in face-to-face relations or else all is lost. Now, there are, there's another wing of the conservative movement, which you know about, which are those com- convinced that tradition matters largely religious conservatives. And and that's all true. Uh, but I think one of the problems with that wing of the conservative party is that it 
it supposes that the only way you can have health is if you have really healthy families and really healthy mediating institutions. And tradition is supposed to be the, the benchmark for that. But the truth of the matter is, in the democratic age, to use Tocqueville's language, not all families are healthy. Uh, not all civic communities are healthy. And so if you start from from putting, if you start with putting tradition up on the pedestal, and then you look around at America, you think, well, this is kind of hopeless. And you and I know from working with Bob Woodson that that's just not the case, that it's precisely among those who have been down and out, uh, who've lost everything, who sometimes find everything too. And so I think we have to, we have to be cognizant of the fact that, that people can repair if they don't come from pristine traditions. Uh, the communities can repair and that oftentimes, and here is I think a huge problem also with the conservative movement. The answers to the problems of communities are to be found in the communities rather than from public policymakers who have abstract ideas about how people behave and no concrete um, engagement with people on the ground. We, we can't know what we need to know except through concrete engagement with real life persons one to one. I want to circle back uh, in a little bit to this observation that you make about perhaps how it is that, you know, the perfectly healthy sort of family unit unit, and perhaps a overly romanticized sort of understanding of the larger sort of history or character of, of American society uh, perhaps is not the most tenable basis upon which to sort of establish sort of a conservative justification for, 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 for hewing to sort of a, uh, patriotic commitment to, you know, the nation as, as a whole or to the importance of the nuclear family. Um, I, I want to return to that, but I do want to uh, ask you very quickly here, given the criticisms of conservatism that you've laid out as it sort of, you know, tends to exist, the, the market orientation, I, I would say perhaps implicit in this is kind of a, a focus on, you know, in individualism in a way that yeah. might be a bit out of proportion to what, you know, uh, thinkers like Tocqueville or Russell Kirk later on may have considered it to be truly, you know, uh, in keeping with, yeah. uh, with a conservatism that was meant to be rooted in community and civil society associations. Why is it that the collectivism that we might associate with various strains of thinking on the left is not perhaps uh, the remedy to the, uh, to the shortcomings of conservatism in this way? Yeah, it's an important question. And I think one thing you need to start with is uh, the insight that the 20th century was the age of two things simultaneously, I think one more than the other. The first was a kind of collectivism. I mean, the grand hopes that we could build a collectivist world, the, 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 the communist aspiration, the fascist aspiration, the national socialist aspiration. So I think it's understandable that America, which does have a liberal tradition, might accentuate the opposite pole which is individualism. So as a, as a remedy to an illness, one could see that it could partly work, that there's an, in, in defending individualism, we perhaps alert um, those who we're talking to about the dangers of collectivism. Mm. But on the other hand, as you indicate, mm. uh, there's something wrong with individualism. And Tocqueville fought this. Tocqueville himself thought that this was a really, really dangerous thing, the democratic age. Remember, it's characterized by loneliness and isolation and delinkage. So, so neither individualism nor collectivism is the answer. And, and Tocqueville provides that third answer. <clears throat> so the individual, he says, is concerned with self-interest. And he asks the question, well, might there be several forms of self-interest? And he says, yeah, there are. There is, on the one hand, there's selfishness, which we all recognize in ourselves and others. But he said, look, there's this other thing, which isn't fully communal. It's not committed to the common good. It's more intermediate between the individual and the collective. And that's our local communities. And he says, it's through these mediating institutions in our local communities. And here we mean our families, our churches, our civic associations, local government, probably too. It's through all these occasions where we can meet in face-to-face -face relations that we can form this other kind of self-interest, what he called self-interest rightly understood. And it's not just a play on words. He really means that in a world with others, your own self-interest is going to be shaped by them. So if you're in a family, you will be formed by them. If you're in a church, you will be formed by them. Now, what Tocqueville got was 
we're still going to be somewhat self-referential. And so we're interested in self-interest and we're going to use experience. Our own experience is the only test of things. But he said, look, individualism will not work. Uh, I think he anticipated collectivism, but he wasn't proposing either of those. He was saying there's this third thing, which we can only build in face-to-face relations. Uh, and, and I think that's his answer to both the Republican slash conservatives who defended individualism against collectivism. And I think it's his answer to the left, too, which is that people don't live in abstract uh, communities committed to the collective good or the common good. They live with their neighbors and we're formed in the immediacy of our environment. And that's the way it should be. So what's very interesting about Tocqueville is he's trying to hew a middle course. And I think, John, this is so important for us today as we see the political polarization rip our country apart. What he saw in the last, the last sentence of the author's introduction was this uh, bifurcation. He says, and I'm quoting him, while the parties busy themselves with tomorrow, I have tried to see the whole of the future. Mm. And what he means by this is the left is moving toward universalism. Um, the right is trying to re-enchant the world. Let's build a liberal world. And he doesn't mean Democratic Party liberal. He means capital L liberal, a liberal world where we greet each other face to face. It's not going to be perfect. It's going to be bumpy. But that's the only thing we have now in what he called the democratic age. And Josh, can you uh, clarify for people who may not understand what you mean by this, uh, what it means to say that the right is trying to re-enchant the world? What is this re-enchantment idea that you're that I've heard you express concern about. Yeah, so uh, Tocqueville doesn't actually use the word re-enchantment. And I, I don't want to simply defend Tocqueville. I'm trying to give us a kind of conceptual framework here. Right. You know, one of the things that you notice if you come out of, if you look at former aristocratic societies like Europe, is that they have a tough time transitioning to the democratic age. And if you look at the early part of the 20th century, you look at re-enchantment movements, meaning movements which which say, look, the contemporary liberal order is a catastrophe. We have all these individuals who are lonely and isolated. What we need to do is to go back to ancient ideas like the German Volk in the case of National Socialism or the, the, the Roman Guard in the case of fascism in Italy. We need to retrieve these ancient ideas so that we have an antidote to this individualism. And what they what they're trying to do is to overcome the experience of loneliness and isolation with a kind of collective identity. Tocqueville knew this was going to happen. And I think he would say to us here at the dawn of the 21st century, this battle with those who wish to go back to a a re-enchanted world will go on for hundreds and hundreds of years. We don't live in a post-war world. We're going to have these re-enchantment movements appearing again and again and again because it's incredibly painful to live as lonely, isolated individuals. <clears throat> Tocqueville knew that, and that's why he proposed what he proposed. Namely, okay, the state can't solve us, kind of collective identity can't solve us, can't solve this problem. But, but what can ameliorate the problem, not solve it, ameliorate it, make it less bad, is if we build a world with our neighbors. And that's the best we get in the democratic age. And I think this is one thing that people don't focus on, but we really need to focus on it. Do we need a certain kind of soul, a certain kind of character to endure the hardships of the democratic age? And I think the answer is yes. First of all, one that's not looking back uh, to, uh, to some disenchanted or re-enchanted, to a future, that w- to a past that was enchanted and hoping to re-enchant the world. We can't do that. Uh, but, but on the left, there's a worry uh, that he has that we'll look toward a kind of cosmopolitan universalism because we're going to look at all the particular commitments we have to being an American citizen, say, to being Christian, to a family of a certain sort. And we're going to say, no, 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 all of these are limiting. And so what we have to do is destroy all the limits. So both the left and the right are dissatisfied with the world as it is. And what Tocqueville wants to suggest is, look, there's a way we can do this. It's not going to be easy. We're going to need the support of our neighbors. There's still going to be some measure of loneliness and, and bipolarity and manic depression, something I hope we get a chance to talk about because I think he's the first one to see this. Yeah. There's still going to be some measure of this, but it's okay. We can build uh, what I call a workable translucence. 
And this is to be distinguished from the longing for authenticity and transparency that we have today among our young people and among the romantic souls uh, of all generations. We're never going to fully understand ourselves. We're never going to fully understand other people. Let's have a workable translucence where we sort of understand ourselves, sort of understand others, but we're called to build a world together and to build a world of competence together. Mm. There's another very important strain of thinking uh, on the left, uh, I think, you know, very uh, visible and, and, and very strongly felt uh, in, our, in our current moment that I'm not sure entirely uh, maps on to the, the phrases universalism, cosmopolitanism, uh, collectivism, even though, you know, we can observe uh, overlaps. But, um, but I'm curious to know uh, sort of where you, um, uh, how you, how you fit this particular strain of thinking in your, um, in your thoughts about community, what community ought to be in an authentic way, and even whether or not there's not some flavor of enchantment in this sort of thinking on the left. And in this, I'm referring to identity politics, something that you've been a real critic of. There's a great deal of language around uh, Unity in modern uh, uh, American identity politics, at least insofar as we talk about the Black community, the LGBTQ community, uh, the Latino community, the trans community, uh, uh, more particularly, and various other things. And it it seems that even within sort of the multicultural political coalition of the left, there is a desire on the one hand for people to not just sort of dissolve their more particular sort of subgroup identities, right? Because yeah. they're sort of charging forward, and you know, I can speak most authoritatively in the context of the Black experience, um, sort of seeking a larger sort of program of redre- redress and, and, and equity that is both sort of an expression of group solidarity, but also a continuation of a historical struggle, at least in the minds of many people who are engaged yeah. in that. There's a romanticization of, you know, of our ancestors, where we come from, yeah. and so forth. Um, you know, how does that fit in your larger analysis? And, and, and what are your critiques of identity politics? Because uh, I believe you've seen it as being a very destructive thing in our, in our, present, uh, in our present day. Yeah, uh, great questions. Um, the first, I am a critic of it, but but what I say to my friends on the right is that what identity politics is trying to do is to get at the question of justice and the mystery of injustice, and and that is very powerful. It's always been a powerful trope in the American imagination, and 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 the way I put it in the book and in, in, in talks I give, I say, look, conservatives understand monetary debt. This is the free market. They understand the debt we owe our fathers. Mm. But there's something deeper that I think identity politics is getting at, a kind of spiritual debt that, that can't be exhausted by talk about tradition and economics. So I want to give identity politics full credit for that. Uh, the other thing, apropos your, your comment just a second ago, there's a longing to be a part of uh, that identity politics uh, gives us. And, you know, consistent with Tocqueville's question, namely, how do we deal with the problem of loneliness and isolation? Identity politics promises to do that. But here's the difficulty. Uh, it is to me deeply painful to hear the, the, the word community. Uh, because I do not believe any one of these communities are univocal. Uh, there is a supposition that Black America is one, that White America is one, that Hispanic is one, that these are unities. Whereas in point of fact, there are tremendous tensions within white America, tremendous tensions within black America, tremendous disunities within all of these factions. So one of my critiques of identity politics is that while it ostensibly puts forth black America as the, in a way the paradigm for the innocent victim on the basis of which uh, the, the paradigm is extended to other groups, like feminists, gay and lesbian and transgender, uh, it, it seems to me that uh, the black Americans who, who refuse that, who, who want not to be considered uh, innocent victims, and here I think the work of the 1776 Unites group is emblematic, uh, they don't get a hearing. They're invisible. And so the, the attempt 
to make visible uh, groups which heretofore had been invisible, which I take to be very noble and which can be understood, I think, within the aspirations of pluralism. That attempt ironically ends up silencing a vast swath of black America that isn't prepared to live by the innocent victim narrative. Let me say a couple more things. Um, I, I am not a believer that that we need to have a fully integrated society. Uh, my father's family is uh, Lebanese. There are still members of my father's family in, in the Worcester area. They came in the 1890s. Much of my father's family peeled off and went in other directions, but there's still a clan, if you want to use that language, that's there, and they're very proud of their ancestry. And so the phrase I often use is just enough liberalism. I want America to be a place not where we give up group affiliations, but where we can recognize that they strengthen us. Uh, they're probably necessary if we're a fragile community, and every immigrant community and some portion of the black community today still remains a fragile community. So I don't want to disband, disband these things at all. I want just enough liberalism. Um, now, but the case of black America is a unique case because it's a case rooted in, in, in slavery, which, yes, white Americans uh, experienced slavery too. Yes, there's all sorts of anecdotal, it's more than anecdotal, it was, it was a large proportion of Jamestown. And you mean that with respect to indentured servitude in the early colonial history of certain European immigrants, yeah? Yes, yes, exactly. But but I do think, and here here I think I do part with a lot of conservatives. Uh, I do think that that the the wound, so to speak, that still resides in America and in Black America because of slavery has to be addressed. And here I think conservatives do themselves a tremendous disservice by by pretending that we live in a post-racial world where everybody's treated on the basis of the content of their character. I mean, here the left, at least, is as I think pernicious as it is, they at least are willing to say that there's a race problem. And when, when conservatives just shut up about it and say nothing, then the left says, well, you must be racist because you have nothing to say about this. You know, oftentimes when I give talks to conservative groups and I and I start in on uh, on how we should address the the legacy of problems in Black America, right. I, I can hear a pin drop because nobody wants to talk about it. And I do think and I'm <laughs> you know, preaching the choir because you and I work together on this. I think Bob Bob Woodson, the Woodson Center, I think he has the way we should think about this, which is uh, along the model of Pharaohs and Josephs that that we're not going to solve this through systemic state action, that the state can be a supplement to mediating institutions in the black community and in all communities, but it can't be a substitute for them, which I think has been the consequence, the full consequence of, of the, uh, the political programs in the 1960s. But, but the model is a local model where you as a responsible citizen, you find the least among us, um, among you, uh, and you quietly ask, how can I help? And and that's going to be a long process. It's going to take generations. But it seems to me that's the only way forward. So I don't believe in collective guilt. Here I think the right is correct. Uh, I do believe in local responsibility, though. And and I don't think the right has a way of talking about it. And I think Bob Woodson um, has a way of talking about it. And I think, uh, you know, I don't betray any confidence by saying he has been immensely frustrated over the course of his 40 years of work. Uh, that conservatives have not understood uh, that that precisely what they profess to want, which is this Tocquevillian community, uh, is is to be found in the history of Black America because mm. the state was opposed to Black America for a long period of time, and that meant that Black Americans survived precisely through strong families and churches, and so they're emblematic of exactly what Tocqueville wants. And in Bob's point, he's right is that when the state stepped in to do good in the 1960s programs, it undermined many of the mediating institutions and to some extent is responsible, therefore, for the decline of, of families, uh, decline of the churches insofar as the state now steps in uh, and takes care of welfare as opposed to charity. So there are very constructive ways to talk about race, uh, and the conservative movement isn't doing it. If I may say one more thing, yeah. you know, I came out of the 1960s. I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, which was a hotbed of of the left mm -hmm. and the strange thing is the things i was committed to then uh, i'm i remain committed to now and those three things are uh an earnest effort to 
to begin to heal the the race wound in America, which I think Bob points the way of doing this, right. a vibrant middle class commercial republic. Uh, the Democratic Party at that point was committed to to w- workers and to unions, and a modest foreign policy where we're not invading countries all over the place. Those are the three things I believe in the 1960s. The Democratic Party doesn't, if, if they believe it, they're not saying it now. Um, I think they've weaponized race. I don't think they're much concerned about the middle class. Uh, and, and it looks to me like they're more than happy to continue to be the war hawks they were in the, in the pre-war, pre-1989 period. Well, you know, you've anticipated an awful lot of what I was going to uh, ask you about. And in particular, um, you uh, sort of <laughs> anticipated uh, sort of a, a direct query I wanted to put, to put towards you, which is whether or not you do have a critique of sort of universalism as an ethos, because we get that a, a lot of times uh, and in our current moment, sort of from the heterodox, uh, classically liberal center, you might say. Uh, you know, conservatives oftentimes feel similarly, but this idea that, um, you know, uh, subgroup identification in any strong way is, uh, is, is a problem, right? Because it leads to tribalization, balkanization, and of course, certainly can. Um, and so some people would say, well, you shouldn't be proud of, proud of your race and so forth. But, you know, the idea of black pride is, is a very big thing, you know, uh, not yeah. universally embraced within Black America, but you know we can we can trace its roots to the to before the Black Power movement. I would I would argue, but it becomes enunciated there. Uh, I guess yeah. a simple way of asking the question is: is if somebody says to you, Josh Mitchell, I am proud of being black, is that a is that a problematic impulse uh, to you? No, no, it's not. Uh, so you know, the the term "just enough liberalism" means. We, in, insofar as we want, we retain our, 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 our heritage, I'll be as broad as I possibly can. We, we retain it and we explore it and we celebrate it. I mean, I, I love Middle Eastern cooking, for example. It's a trite mm-hmm. example. Uh, but I also consider myself, you know, very much an American. So I think the healthy, a uh, healthy United States would be one in which we can recognize and, and, and be happy about our legacy, uh, but also know that it's not, it's not quite enough. That we're, we're both our legacy and we're more than our legacy. I mean, I have to get a bit personal here. Uh, so the, the standard account is that after three or four generations, people get integrated, assimilated into America. And the first generation, I'll speak of my Lebanese heritage, the first generation came and they didn't learn English. They didn't learn English at all. Yeah. The second generation, my father's generation did. And my father's generation and most second generation immigrants and many black Americans are, are torn and they cannot resolve the tension between, between two poles, both of which they know are true. Uh, mm. I'm an American and I'm not yet an American. Right, right. And, and then, you know, there, it's, it is possible over time that all that gets washed away and you might have a certain fondness for certain food and cultural, uh, heritage, uh, points, but, but you don't really identify them, you don't identify with them. So I'm, I think we have to be honest about what America looks like, which is we have all of these connections to our past. Um, we can't let them become merely tribal. Uh, so we can be both, we can have our heritage, but we have to be more than that too. And I think an honest ex- account of our experience in America is, is that two things are true. We're both Americans and we're not yet Americans. We, we have all this, this past that, that we don't want to give up. But Bob has a wonderful phrase. The opposite of segregation is not integration. It's desegregation. Mm-hmm. It's a brilliant insight because desegregation was a legal regime that kept people in one place. Right. You don't want to keep people in one place, but you don't want to force them to completely be integrated either. Martin Luther King Jr. Drew, drew the exact same distinction, right? The difference yeah. between a meaningful sort of uh, integration, which there's authentic sort of, I, I think you take issue with the term, but sort of inclusion, right? You know, versus just sort of restructuring things to where we're all sitting next to each other, right? Uh, by yeah. edict of the state. Right. So we have to be able to live in that awkward intermediate condition, which isn't one or the other thing. Mm-hmm. 
And, you know, one of the things that haunts me after all my years of, of reading Tocqueville and just reading generally is, is I think the, the wisest of guides tell us that there aren't any easy solutions. It's not integration. It's not tribalism. Uh, and to come back to the, the source of your question, right? You've got cosmopolitans who, who want to, want us to completely give up on, on any of the particularist commitments we have, whether it's to our race, or an understanding of family or national patriotism. They, they want to do that. And the way it's often set up in that camp is, well, the alternative is, is tribalism, if you use the word, blood and soil nationalism. And I think this opposition is a really dangerous one because I don't think you can build a world on either of those. You, we are embodied creatures. We literally have bodies. We, we have to feed ourselves. We live locally. We look into each other's eyes locally. Uh, we derive our, our psychic nourishment from face-to-face relations. And, and those are going to be particular. Uh, you're going to have, you're going to be surrounded by particular religions in one area and, and not in others. My father's family, uh, you know, was a minority community in the Islamic world for 1200 years. Uh, so you, you have to be able to live within the particulars. Uh, but you have to understand that they're never going to be quite enough. So I think what, again, why Tocqueville is so important is he sees a middle course. Mm-hmm. It's not either blood and soil nationalism or universalism. It's embodied communities. And I say this with, with particular, uh, uh, agony now because of what's happening in Europe. So the way it's set up now in Europe by the, by the elites is you have to be committed to a transnational, a post-national Europe. Right. And this is a terrible idea. Uh, and you're seeing all sorts of reactions against it. And I've, I've talked with various political leaders on the ground, especially the young ones. And I will say I'm, I'm troubled by the extent to which they are tempted by blood and soil nationalism. So you've got this pairing of blood and soil nationalism and universalism, both of which are pernicious. And we have to somehow find a way to recover the understanding that as embodied beings, the largest unit we can live in and and build around is the nation, period. We can have transnational commitments and treaties, but the nation is the largest unit. And the only way we can have a healthy respect for the nation is if you and I at the local level are stakeholders in our world. And then we can begin to imagine that our country is a really great place because we have some capacity to to alter the course of our lives here. We've got political agency in our local communities. Well, with respect to the nation, I want to return us to the subject uh, heritage, and and you've pointed to the theme a number of times in the conversation here. Um, One thing I am aware that uh, Tocqueville uh, wrote in Democracy in America was that, uh, first of all, that the United States of America was in a very unique position insofar as it was the only great nation that had come to being recently enough to have its nascent sort of experience and coming to its own be observable for all the world to see. Yeah. That, you know, in the period of time that they lived, you you couldn't look back, you know, true clarity on the beginnings of civilization in Britain or France or Russia or or China, because it's just lost to the distant path and past and to the mythologizing that's layered on top the histories of those nations, you know, age after age. But the United States of America was born in living memory. And and so de Tocqueville uh, wrote, as I recall, that, um, well, he made the claim that any and all uh, behaviors and even events in the life of an individual can be traced back to the most nascent sorts of experiences in mm-hmm. their lives, and he has a phrase in there along the lines of, "You can see the f- you can see the full grown man uh, through the baby in the cradle." In the cradle, yeah. right, right, something like that. And he makes the precise same analogy. He makes that, and he introduces that idea as completely applicable to the life of nations. I want to bring that observation uh, to this larger question of, you know, what should our relationship be? Uh, to the United States of America and and her history, uh, as um, as as an idea and, and and something that 
that we either embrace or reject on on the basis of sort of the, the the guilt or innocence that we see ourselves as heir to by virtue of our relationship to that to that heritage yeah. and uh you know i you know i know that you have a critique of both the right and the left in the way we talk about yeah. the american experiment uh in that in that vein let me let me just say one just sort of quick thing which is that in the work that I do um, uh, with Brave Angels and and my larger sort of you know sort of engagement of the public discourse, I've always placed a very high premium on engaging people not just on the basis of the opinions they express, but against the backdrop of the of the history that that follows us in our political and cultural lineages in this country, because it says a lot about why we see the world the way that we do. I may disagree with. A number of African Americans and other social justice oriented folks on the left, uh, in terms of my believing that this really is, in you know, at its heart, a land of opportunity that strives towards greater equality, where others have a more pessimistic view. But I've also lived alongside Black people who look back on a history that begins with slavery, goes into Ku Klux terrorism, travels through. Uh, segregation, the Jim Crow uh, experience, but then goes to mass incarceration and the drug war and the entrenched poverty uh, of the 70s and 80s and into the into the LA riots in the 90s. Yeah. And you tell that story and you realize there's no point at which the American dream shows up for many people. And so why wouldn't they see America uh, in this way? Uh, at the same time, people with a very different experience are going to look at it uh, differently. Um so with this heritage point in mind, what is the heart of the critique of the right and left approach to defining just what America is? And what would, what would your view be? There's two parts to, to, that I would have to answer. So, so the first, you mentioned Tocqueville's observation that at the beginning is the whole man. Right. And I think what he's trying to do there, and it, it ties in with what you're saying, he, he's, he's trying to alert these you know, silly Americans who think they're self-made. That no, you're, you're carried along by forces that you don't fully understand. Mm. And so to your, and I have great admiration for how you handle this with braver angels. Uh, you know, you're, you need to listen to what people, the account they give of where they've come from. It's really important to do that. And, and all of us can give some account that's deeper than just the declarations of, of what we believe. Uh, but, but then there's also mysteries that, that carry us along. So the way I describe this, this to my class is, you know, there, there are numbers of different peoples here. White is not one, black is not one. But, and I mentioned the fact that the, the Scots Irish, which turn out to be the largest ethnic group in America, have a, something deep in their history, uh, that shows up with every generation, even if they don't know about it. And that's, this is a deep suspicion of monarchy, uh, of concentrations of political power. Not by accident um, do these people form the most patriotic uh, part of our country. Uh, not by accident are they Trump supporters. And then I say, you know, of, of Black America, what's the, what's the central trope that, that is, can be named and sometimes not named? And it's the wounded body. Mm. And so George Floyd, incarceration, I mean, th this is... This is a kind of originary, constitutive aspect of experience that that carries forward generation to generation. And I think if you don't understand the wounds of people, uh, you, you can't understand the valence of particular events. That's the first thing I would say. Right. But now to your precise question, what's the problem with the left and the right? So when the when Hannah Nicole Jones came out with the 1619 Project, uh, it was really remarkable to see the reaction to it. First, <clears throat> her project claims that the Jamestown colony was the one that really constitutes America, right. not the Puritan colony. Uh, because in the Jamestown colony, slavery was introduced. Slavery was there at the beginning. It's a strangely Tocquevillian argument, right? What was there at the beginning endures forever. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so systemic, so racism was there at the beginning. Racism is there now. And so America is systemically racist. So it, it, it is stained. And I think the further implication is, is it's twofold. Uh, either it's so stained that you just give up because systemic racism is, is so pernicious that there's nothing you can do, uh, or it's sufficiently 
manageable, but only the state can manage it. And so the political implications of that position is we need more state programs, more need, need more state intervention, more DEI, uh, more unconscious bias training, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so the problem is so big that maybe the state alone can help it. Well, that's a deeply anti Tocquevillian view. Uh, and I think it's precisely the opposite that we need now. We need to get back to community and deal with each other face to face. But the right was equally strange in its reaction because in a funny way, both the right and the 1619 project had, have the same presupposition. The right's response to Hannah Nicole Jones was no America is pure. The founding was pure. Slavery was an accident, uh, <clears throat> which was not inscribed into the American constitution. Uh, and it was erased with 1865, to which the left has all sorts of answers, some of them quite good. Uh, but as I said, they both share the same supposition. Namely, the only way something can be defended is if it's pure. Right. So Hannah Nicole Jones rejects America because it's impure, and the, and the conservatives defend it because she is pure. And I think the proper Christian answer, and I have to be honest with you, John, because that's the way I think about it. The Christian answer is the whole of the world of time is broken. Uh, it began with Adam and Eve. And so in a funny way, there's an admission that Hannah Nicole Jones is right, that the, that the founding is, is impure. But the question is, what do you do with that? Conservatives say, well, if it's impure, it has to be thrown out because only purity matters. And, and my view is, no, all of time is broken and impure, stained with sin. All of time is. And so the question is, what do you do with the broken world? And as I said, the 1619 projects presuppose that what you do with the stained world is either you can't do anything or you hand it over to the state. And then the Tocquevillian response is, no, what you do with the stained world is you labor and hope knowing the brokenness of human life. This returns us to my earlier observations about the, the, the limits of a conservatism based on the purity of family, for example. Right. Many families are broken. Does that mean they're irredeemable? Does that mean you give up hope? So I think the Christian answer is to say with Hannah Nicole Jones, yeah, you're right, but, but stain is not the final word. Uh, the final word is hope, and, and the agony of human life is to live with the full knowledge of your own stain and others and yet not give up hope. And so America, you know, has been broken from the beginning. And here again, I'm, I'm somewhat theological. I, I do think that, that, uh, I'll say it as directly as I can, that, that we are being watched by God and that we have a, a covenant to fulfill. Uh, and that part of that covenant is healing the wounds in America, slavery being one of them. Uh, and that we, we aren't going to do it tomorrow or we're not going to do it next year. Uh, and, and there'll be new wounds to come in the hundreds of years that are ahead of us. Um, and, and the real question before us is whether we are going to live in hope in the face of the brokenness of human life or whether we're going to give up or hand it over to the state. And my answer and the 1776 Unites answer is we're not going to give up. There are, there are tremendous examples that, that the whole of America needs to see. Uh, in black experience, for example, you know, precisely when the state was at its worst, again, I'm paraphrasing quoting Bob, uh, black America was at its best. Uh, so, so let us look to those examples of people who are black and white and, and others, people who are faced with tremendous adversity, uh, and, and yet hope prevailed. America desperately needs that lesson right now. And not just, you know, at, at the lower, uh, lower economic ladder of society, but at the highest of ladders, because we're living in a society at the moment that seems to have given up on hope, sees no ground for resilience, and we desperately need that lesson. Mm. The commentary on hope is really, I think, uh, a poignant and important one. I think in part because I think that maybe we've lost any deeply substantive sort of appreciation of what hope is beyond something um, akin to a wish. But, uh, you know, you mentioned Nicole Hannah-Jones. Uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones said in a, in, uh, in public talk, uh, in a public talk once that, um, you know, sort of stemming from, you know, just the observation that you've, uh, recounted here that, that she's 
made in the 1619 project that the United States is sort of um, perhaps even irreparably stained or nearly so the basis of this original sin of slavery and everything that sort of uh, continued from it, she said that she actually uh, does not expect anything that she does in her, you know, work or to actually, you know, help, to actually sort of fix the problem, to actually make things better. Uh, you know, she, she, in spite of all of her success, and she's incredibly successful and, and, and very, you know, respected by, by many people, but, um, and yet, you know, she's deeply pessimistic about even her own efforts being able yeah. to, you know, accomplish anything good. Um, and, and yet, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., um, uh, you know, said that, you know, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. He had this deep sort of sense that there was a momentum uh, to, to, to love and the moral will uh, of the creator that, of course, we had to actively participate in, not taking for granted that you know, things yeah. get better without us putting our hands on, on the wheel. And Barack Obama, of course, you know, uh, we, we all remember just his frequent reference to this idea of the moral arc of the universe being long but bending towards justice, uh, echoing, yeah. echoing. Um, but, you know, so much of what made, I think, King a distinct and perhaps uniquely powerful moral voice in the context of American politics, this larger uh, story that we are all living through, this odyssey of race in America mm -hmm. and so forth, is that uh, King, who certainly was a person uh, with his own particular political and policy points of view, but he was a messenger for this larger transcendent uh, notion, uh, Christian notion, um, although he, he was also, of course, influenced by Kandi and nonviolence, and she has a yeah. you know, relationship to Hinduism and so forth, that uh, even the worst, even the even the most uh, blatant sinners amongst us have the capacity for redemption, right? And that we have to ultimately love our enemies in an effort to call forth the better angels of their natures yeah. by expressing them ourselves, right? By leading with them ourselves. King was very clear in making a distinction between you know the idea of evil persons versus people who just happen to be caught up in forces of evil. So he introduced yeah. this narrative of of redemption, which kind of lubricated so much of the social change that came out of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel like and, and so hope came hope sort of sprang from from that. Um it doesn't seem like this um narrative of the possibility of redemption, regardless of what your politics are, but this idea that we can speak to the good in each other, that we all are imperfect human creatures, that we are broken, right? To use the terminology you yeah. used, but that we can be, that we can be redeemed. It doesn't seem to fit very neatly in these sort of rhetorical toolkits of the left and the right today. But do you have hope that this way of seeing things this Kingian uh, vision, this Tocquevillian sort of ethos, because I think that they actually harmonize uh, yes. at, at the core. Um, you know, do you have hope that this can be revived in our present time? And if so, what gives you that hope? Great question. I'm haunted by it all the time. So Martin Luther King uh, gave what's probably the most important speech in the 20th century in, in America on the, on the steps of the Lincoln Monument. And it was a, it was a, it was a Jeremiah. Now, what's a Jeremiah? Well, it, it is a call to a, to a people to return home. It's a, it's a trope. It's a, it's a way of speaking that goes all the way back to the Old Testament. And, and I remind my students now that, that everyone in America still had at that point enough religious fluency to understand exactly the reference that he was making. So when he said, I may not get there with you, everyone knew exactly the reference. It was Moses yeah. leading the people. And so you had, I think part of the reason for King's power is that you, you still had theological fluency across America. What happened, maybe as a consequence of the Vietnam War, I don't know. Uh, the, the mainline churches, for the most part, aligned with the Vietnam War. They were discredited because of their alignment, and the mainline churches have completely collapsed. 
And so uh, the cause for despair at the current moment is that the language of hope that spoke that that King spoke and that much of America still understood when the mainline churches were intact has disappeared. There is no theological fluency. I've noticed even in the last 30 years of my teaching at Georgetown, my students who are ostensibly Catholic, many of them, they have no theological fluency whatsoever. And what has replaced the, the language of hope has been identity politics, which seeks to establish a, an easy moral economy according to which some are pure and some are stained, and you can figure out what you are exactly by looking up your intersectional scorecard. Uh, there's no possible way you can get hope out of that. You just carve up the world based on who has the right to speak and who doesn't. Now, having said all that, I say to my to my friends and colleagues that identity politics turns out to be a heresy within the churches because it's three central categories, the innocent victim, the scapegoat, and irredeemable stain all achieve their coherence only within the the, the historical uh, rhetoric of, of the mainline churches. And so my argument is we're living in a strange, heretical moment when the fragments of Christianity in America are, are out there now in the form of identity politics. And so I say to my friends, the problem is not that identity politics goes too far, it's that it doesn't go far enough. By which I mean, the scapegoat is a real category. The innocent victim is a real category. Irredeemable sin, our sin is real categories. But we have to understand them in a fully Christian way if we're going to, um, first of all, understand the language of Jeremiah. Uh, but more importantly, if we're going to build the world together, we have to start with the fact that notwithstanding wounds, and I do not diminish wounds that have actually occurred in the past and continue to happen now, uh, we, we must all admit and this is the very difficult thing, that within all of us, there lies the, the source of stain and brokenness. And that if we renounce that and say, no, no, it's not me, it's somebody else, then we'd lose moral responsibility. We'd lose the incentive to look deep within our own souls to see what we can do, notwithstanding the constraints under which we live. The, the most important words of the Bible are the ones uttered by Adam and Eve. You know, It wasn't me, it wasn't me. I, I, I didn't do it, it's not my fault. So my argument is that we have to all, notwithstanding you know, the agony that this would entail, we have to all return to that, that particular understanding, and which is to say it's only through the revitalization of the churches um, who call the identity politics heretics home, it's only through that, that process that, that we can return to an America that recognizes wounds um, that understands that there's a mystery of suffering we can't fully solve. Nevertheless, we have to keep working at it uh, uh, directly, hands-on, day-to-day. Uh, so I have hope insofar as identity politics parishioners come to realize that their attempt to think through the scapegoat, the innocent victim, and irredeemable stain, it, it comes up short. And when it comes up short, then I think Christians have to say, you've been feasting on crumbs come back to the table, mm. uh, because that's where the meal is. This is fundamentally a religious crisis. And it's not going to matter whether you're a Democrat or Republican, whether you get Trump or Biden or somebody else in 2024, the problem will continue, because our country is suffering a spiritual crisis at the moment. Uh, it, the left knows which terms to look at, but it doesn't know the framework within which to put them. Well, it sounds to me as if part of what's true here, uh, Josh, is that uh, true unity can only be found through community and that we can only discover community uh, by ministering to the brokenness exists in each other uh, and within ourselves. And our capacity to do that, demonstrated before, um, gives me hope for what can be again. So, Joshua Mitchell, uh, I fully expect for folks uh, following Braver Angels and Uniting America uh, to hear from you again. It's my great honor and privilege to call you a friend and to welcome you to the show. Thank you, John. It's been great talking with you. Thank you for listening to Uniting America. If you'd like to support the show, you can do it by subscribing on YouTube and on your favorite podcast platform and leaving us a positive rating, review, or suggestions. Follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and tune in for more content. And learn more about the movement to depolarize America at braverangels.org.